be in 2 Kings chapter 12. 2 Kings chapter 12. Y'all, as I was looking over my notes, I realized this is the first time in four weeks that I have preached to you on a Wednesday night. Um, three or four weeks ago, we canceled the service because of Tropical Storm Elsa. And then the following week after that, I had to take an emergency trip to the hospital with my mother. So Brother Terry filled in for me. And then last week, we were out of town on our family reunion. Brother Scott did a great job filling in for me. I appreciate these men that God's brought here to help us with the ministry. But we'll pick back up now in 2 Kings chapter 12. A month ago, the last time I had the opportunity to preach to you on a Wednesday night, I shared with you a message entitled, Lessons from Jehoash and Jehoiada. Jehoash was the king in the land of Judah, and Jehoiada was the high priest, the high priest of the Lord. So a month ago, it was Lessons from Jehoash and Jehoiada. Tonight, the final part of this message is entitled, More Lessons from Jehoash and Jehoiada. So let's pick up there in 2 Kings 12. I'd like to encourage you to have your pen ready and a notepad to write some notes down as the Lord may speak to your heart. Let's start in verse 1. I'm going to read down through verse 15. I'm honored to share the Word of God with you this evening. Verse 1, the Bible says, In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, and forty years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Man, wouldn't you like it to be said of your life that and you did what was right in the sight of the Lord? That's not always easy to do. But may God give us the grace and may God direct us to do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, But the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. That's letting us know that although Jehoash was doing right, there was still an area of compromise in his life. Verse 4, And Jehoash said to the priests, All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passeth the account, the money that every man is set at, And all the money that cometh into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them, let the priest, repair the breaches. Breaches is what the King James says, or repair the damage of the house, the house of the Lord, wheresoever any breach shall be found. But it was so that in the three and twentieth year of King Jehoash, The priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. Then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests, and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. The king wanted the house of the Lord repaired. Verse 8, And the priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest, or you might say like a box, and bored a hole in the lid of it, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priests that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. Doesn't that sound familiar, y'all? Verse 10, And it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. By the way, how many people did they have handling the money, y'all? Two. Two. Always two. Verse 11, And they gave the money, being told or being counted, into the hands of them that did the work, that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. All right, the priests weren't getting the job done, so they turned it over to, to somebody else. And look at the rest of verse 11. And they laid it out to the carpenters, like Brother Scott, and builders, like Brother Scott. The carpenters and builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. So they turned the money over to the workers. Verse 12, and they turned it over to the masons and hewers of stone and to buy timber. 
Boy, that's expensive nowadays, isn't it? Amen. To buy timber and huge stone to repair the breaches or the damage of the house of the Lord, and for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. Howbeit there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. That's good they repaired the house, didn't they? One more verse, verse 15. Moreover, they reckoned it not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen, for they dealt faithfully. These men they could trust with handling the money. Y'all, as we look in tonight's passage, I want to remind you, first of all, we can, although we're learning, living in New Testament days, we can always learn things from the Old Testament, can't we? Amen. Romans 15, 4 says, For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Oh, let, may God help us to be in, in students of the entire Bible, including the Old Testament. There's good principles, good truth in the Old Testament that can help us in New Testament times. And I've got five or six points I want to just run through with you here for a few moments. Uh, some of them, I'll be honest with you, are just a little bit of review from last month. Like uh, point number one comes from verse one. I hope you'll notice this with me. We talked about it last month, but... You know me, you, those of you who've been with me for four years now, you know that to me, repetition is the key to learning. Amen? Amen. Going over and over and over. Verse number one. It says, in the seventh year of Jehu, now that was the king of Israel. Jehu is a different man. In the seventh year of Jehu, then Jehoash began to reign, and he was reigning in a different country called Judah. So Jehoash is the new leader of Judah. This is, verse one marks the beginning of his reign. King. Y'all want to remind you of this thought. Sometimes it just helps to have new leadership. The previous leader in Judah was a wicked woman. And she was uh, turning the, the, the people of God, the people of Judah, away from the things of the Lord. Oh, but how, thank God, how God brought in Jehoash. And um, y'all, we're, we're excited about Lulutin Baptist Church, like I shared with you a little while ago. Just this, the demographics, so to speak, of our crowd here tonight. You know, if you could just compare it from four years ago, praise God, we, God we know the good things we see happening. We're excited about it. But I want you to know, in the next weeks and months and years, we, we've been praying for and we believe God's going to be bringing in new leaders. Okay? And uh, remember, like we've shared with you just in recent weeks, and we've talked about this a year and two years ago, we're praying that God would fill this church with spiritual leaders and with prayer warriors. And beloved, I want to encourage you to pray that along with your pastor. That he'll bring in spiritual leaders and prayer warriors. And you know what? We also believe the Holy Spirit wants to do in the Lord's church. We believe he wants to raise up from right in our midst. Spiritual leaders and prayer warriors. And sometimes it just helps to have new leaders come in. Hey, it kind of helps to take off the load too, doesn't it? Yeah. Can I just share a blessing with you? You know, we, we shared with you on Sunday about the how kind of a couple of the plans fell through for getting the grass cut lately and appreciate one of the men stepped up and I know some of y'all would like to do this, but just your health or your schedule hinders you from doing it. But just one of the men came to me after church Sunday and said, Hey, preacher, my boy and I will cut the grass. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what happened was, and this was just done totally by accident, and it wasn't done by the, by the brother who cut the grass, but I think one of the blades may have been put on upside down on the, on the tractor. That's why it kind of has a unique design out there. <laughs> but... It looks a whole lot better than it did Sunday, doesn't it? Amen. <laughs> yes, amen. And uh, it, it, it helps for people to see the need and take the lead. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. Um, and, and I want to be positive on that. But I also want to encourage you, just like we're praying that the Lord will bring in leaders into this ministry, and we mean that, leaders, led by the Spirit of God. And we're praying that God will raise up leaders from within our midst, 
We believe the Lord can do that. We believe the Lord will do that. But at the same time, I want you to know, Satan will try to bring in some leaders here too. I'm telling you right now. Satan will try to... And, and you know how Satan works, okay? And, you know, uh, um, you know, when, when Satan puts on a beer commercial on TV, boy, he doesn't, he doesn't show a car accident where you know, bodies are mangled and vehicles are twisted and on fire or whatever. He'll put cool-looking people on there with cool music. And, you know, when Satan brings in his leaders, it's like an angel of light, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you'll hold your place there in 2 Kings, let's flip over to the New Testament for a moment and see a, a statement made by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 7. If you look with me in Matthew 7 and verse number 15... Now, we already heard from Wallace. I wonder if there's any other brave volunteer. If not, that's okay. But any brave volunteer who would like to read for us this statement. Miss Lana, thank you. These are the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 7 and verse 15, please. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. All right, and that's the Lord Jesus talking. And hey, I believe that's a message for us today. For Christians worldwide, as well as Christians right here at Lulitan Baptist Church, the Lord Jesus is saying, beware, the Lord has his servants, the Lord will raise up his leaders, but Satan will do the same thing. And when, and when those false prophets come in, y'all, are they looking like wild wolves? What are they looking like? They're looking like sheep, like one of us, <laughs> right? But the Lord says, on the inside, they're dangerous. Now, watch what happens. You know, the Lord Jesus says they're false teachers that he says they might look like sheep, like godly people of the Lord, but on the inside, they belong to the enemy. Watch over here also in Acts. Look at Acts chapter 20 for a moment. I believe actually we looked at this passage a month ago. Let's look at it again one more time. Acts chapter 20. And, uh, yeah, I remember now sharing this with you. Remember this was Paul. He was traveling. I believe he was traveling back towards Jerusalem. And he wanted to share a message with the leaders, the church leaders at Ephesus. All right, and look what he said to these church leaders at Ephesus who had met him uh, as he was traveling towards Jerusalem. He says this, verse 29. We're down through verse 31. Paul says this to these church leaders. Let's start, you know what, let's start with verse 27. Paul says to these leaders, he says, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Hey, we want to preach the gospel, but we also want to share all the counsel of God. Amen? Amen? Verse 28, he says, take heed. Now, that kind of sounds like what the Lord Jesus said to Matthew 7. He said, beware. Here he's saying, take heed. It basically means watch out. Be on the lookout for this. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Like, remember, that's the term for a bishop. That's what an overseer is. To feed the church of God. That's what a shepherd should do, a pastor. To feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. Then Paul says this. For I... What's that next word, y'all? He says, I know this is going to happen to you, church. He's giving this warning to the church. He says, I know this that after my departing shall grievous, what's that next word? Wolves. wolves. Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And who are those wolves? Those are false teachers coming in. They look like sheep. But Paul says, oh, no, remember, they actually have a very different message and a very different plan. Verse 30, he says, also of your own selves. He says, hey, not only are Satan's leaders going to come from the outside, but even from within your own group, shall men rise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. See, a good leader is going to encourage you to follow who? The Lord, yes. A false leader is going to encourage you to follow them. Then finally, verse 34, therefore, watch. Watch, he says, take heed, he says, Watch, Jesus said, beware. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, 
I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Mm. Y'all going back to our original point now and going back to our text in 2 Kings 12. Hey, it's uh, it, it, sometimes it just helps to have new leaders. And we thank God. We believe God's bringing leaders into this ministry. We believe He's going to raise up leaders from within this ministry. But we always want to be on guard for Satan's influence as well. Amen? Amen. Uh, that's just the world in which we live. A uh, next point comes from verse 4. We talked about this um, uh, last month. Look at verse 4. And Jehoash, that's the king of Judah. We're back in 2 Kings 12 now. And Jehoash said to the priests, All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passes the account, the money that everyone is set at, every man is set at, and all the money that comes into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord. There they are talking about money. And you know what? I don't know. It might be in your Bible. It, it might not. If it's, if it's not, that's okay. But in this copy of the Bible I have, it's got the date, the date, the approximate date of when this story took place. And it tells us here at the top of the page that this story with Jehoash and how he wanted to repair the house of God, it, it took place about 900 B.C. You know, now we live, that was 900 years before Christ was born. Now we live like 2,000 plus years after Christ was born. Here's what I'm trying to say. Almost 3,000 years ago, God's people were talking about money then. God's people have been financially supporting God's work for thousands of years. Amen. By the way, what a blessing to do so. Amen? Yes. Amen. Ooh, that was a little weak. Oh, we can do better than that. Amen. What a blessing to be used of God to support His work financially. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, well, watch this. If you hold your place there in 2 Kings again, Watch this. Go back to Deuteronomy for a moment. When you turn back to Deuteronomy chapter, let's go to chapter 16. You know what's really amazing, y'all? As you turn from 2 Kings back in the Bible to Deuteronomy 16, you're turning back about like about 500 years in time. So about 500 years before Jehoash was talking to God's people in Judah, look here in Deuteronomy 16 and... Um, Verse 17, here Moses is talking to the people of God out in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 16, 17. Here's a message Moses is giving from the Lord to God's people. Any brave volunteer want to read that verse? We have already heard from Lana, we've heard from Wallace. Somebody, all right, Miss Lynn, if you read 16, 17, please. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Amen, thank you. What's those first two words, y'all, in that verse? Every man. Every man. Hey, I want to encourage everybody to give. Now, what you give between you and the Lord, I believe God will bless you by getting by starting off with your tithe. But here in Deuteronomy, we see every man. There in verse 17. Then if you go back over again to 2 Kings 12, if you look in the middle of the verse, it talks about even the money of everyone. And then a little bit later it says that the money that every man is set at, and the money that comes into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord. And then look at one more verse with me over in the New Testament. We'll go back to 2 Kings 12 in a second, but look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Deuteronomy, Miss Lynn read to us, the Bible says, every man. 2 Kings, it says, every one, every man, any man, giving, investing financially in the, in the work of the Lord. Now look here at 2 Corinthians 9, and watch, look at verse 7, y'all. Somebody just tell us, what's the first two words in verse 7? Every man. Every man. You kind of see that theme being repeated over and over again? You know what's sad, y'all? <coughs> You've heard me say this statistic maybe a couple of months ago. But um, something to the effect of uh, uh, 20, in, in, in an average church in America today, about 20% of the people tithe. Mm -hmm. Just want to remind you, the Bible teaches over and over again, every man. Look again at verse 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 
Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a what, y'all? Cheerful giver. Lord, please give us a spirit of generosity. Amen. And I want to remind you, the, the Lord, I believe this with all my heart, the Lord reminds me to pray this for y'all on a regular basis, almost to the point where it's daily. In fact, I was sitting down at my little desk in our dining room today, writing out the notes for tonight. It was like the Lord just directed me to stop and pray this to you for you tonight. And this is a regular prayer for you. Praying that the Lord will bless you. That the Lord will bless you physically. He knows where you're hurt physically, doesn't he? I'm praying that the Lord will bless you physically, financially, spiritually, mentally. Boy, this, this world will work on your mind, won't it? I'm praying that the Lord will bless you emotionally. Physically, financially, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. And I've been praying, and it's, it's like the Holy Spirit has been telling me to pray this for you. That God would bless you in, in those ways, big and small. In every area, spiritually, financially, physically. And I've been praying, the Lord's been leading me to pray for you, that when He does bless you, He'll bless you in such a way that you'll know it was from God. Amen. The Lord blessed you. But that's not the end of the prayer yet. There's two more parts to it. And then it's like the Lord reminds me to pray for you that as you get blessed, number one, you'll remember the blesser. Give thanks to God. And appreciate Him. Not just on the Wednesday nights, y'all. Amen. Amen. But even in a private time. Number one, remember the blesser. And then number two, understand that He blesses you for you to be a what, y'all? A blesser including with our tithes and our offerings. Say amen right there. Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> Going back to our text, from nearly 3,000 years ago, God's people were financially, financially supporting God's work. Let's look at verse number 5. 2 Kings 12, 5. Let the priests take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches or the damage of the house. We're talking about the Lord's house, right? That's the context. Wheresoever any breach shall be found. Y'all, here's the point. We want to make sure God's house is in good shape. Amen. We understand that today this building is really not the God, God's house. Y'all, according to the New Testament, what is actually God's house? the members, the members corporately, then your body individually. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so my point is, you know, from the text, is make sure God's house is in good shape. In that, in that context, it was the temple of the Lord back 3,000 years ago. But we want to make sure that this temple is in good shape too, right? As best as we can. But we could also, in a way, refer to this building. We, we want to make sure God's house is in good shape. Hey, I want to compliment you, give praise to God and compliment you that just in the midst of all this COVID, and it's, you know, we're just a little flock here, but y'all, because of your generosity and the goodness of God, I mean, this building, this whole building, the exterior got painted, the whole campus. I mean, even our little pump house over there got painted. Thank God. That was the first time in maybe, what, 10 or 15 years, Miss Linda, you think? Something like that? The sanctuary had been painted. Twenty years. Between two thousand and ten and two thousand, it was sometime before that. See, y'all, what you're doing is you're trying to kind of repair the house of God, so to speak, trying to uh, make sure it's in good shape. Now, I just want to throw this out here too. Just something else to pray about. I said, man, brother Steve has a lot of things to pray about. Yes, but praise the Lord, Amen. Yeah. But you know, and this is not a complaint. Thank God for the facilities we have, Amen. Yeah. But I don't think the inside of this building has been updated since it was built. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. 
Y'all, this building, the first service was in 1992. Nineteen ninety two. That's what the that's what our historical books are. Y'all, not complaining. Thank God for these facilities. But next year will mark thirty years, y'all. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that God's house is in good shape. And that that's what they were doing here. They were they were saying here in Second Kings, hey man, let's fix it up. It's time for an update. Okay, I need to hurry along. Okay? Um, look with me if you would please. Again, in verse 4, see at the beginning of verse 4, it says, Jehoash, the king says to the priest, he's saying, you take the money that the people of God is giving. And then in verse 5, he says, let the priests take it to them. Let them take the money the people of God are giving to the work of God. And let them, let the priest repair the damages to the house. That was the original plan. The king said, priest, you take the money the people of God are giving, and you take it, get the house of God fixed up. But look what happens in verse 6. But it was so that in the 3 and 20th year of King Jehoash, the priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. And verse 7, then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest. He's, the, he's like the head priest, the high priest. And he called the other priests and said to them, why did you not repair the breaches of the house? Here's the point, y'all. Not every plan works out the way it was originally intended. Okay. In the months and years to come, Pastor Steve and your ministry team, we're going to come and present to you all these different plans and perhaps programs and ideas. Just want to remind you, we, got, we just got to be aware of the fact that it's not a perfect world, right? It's not always going to work out the way we originally intended. In this case... What would y'all just what would y'all say is going on here? What what had happened? Negligence. Delay. As a result of the priest's negligence. I just want you to be open to the fact that not every plan works out the way it was originally intended. Let's jump down. I'm gonna try to wrap things up. Jump down to verse 11. So they go to plan B. They wind up giving the money to these overseers. Look at verse 11. They gave the money, being told, being counted, into the hands of them that did the work that had the oversight. You might say these are maybe like, kind of like the supervisors or the managers of the construction site. Kind of like Brother Scott's role at his job. All right? Uh, they gave the money to the, the uh, managers that had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they laid it out to the carpenters and builders that wrought upon the, those guys who worked on the house of the Lord and to the masons and the hewers of stone, and to buy timber and huge stone. Here's the point, y'all. Uh, what it wound up being was it just was a team of people getting together to make it all happen, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just one man, yeah. or one particular group, or one little clique. It was the carpenters, the builders, the masons, the hewers, the, the lumber people. The, the priests who were finally getting on right track and doing the right thing, and the overseers, and, and the king kind of holding everybody uh, accountable. Hey, it was teamwork, and teamwork makes the dream work, right? right. Amen. As we're looking for God to, uh, to move in our midst here, we can expect him to bring in leaders and raise up leaders. We want to be on guard for the, the, uh, the wolves that Satan will try to bring in. Uh, we want to look to the Lord and say, Lord, would you just use me to show me how I can be a blessing financially to the work of God here? Uh, we understand that some plans might be presented and sometimes those plans may fall apart for whatever reason. But as we go to a plan B or a plan C or D or whatever, we want to work together as a team Amen. And, and realize that God listened to this, brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of you are looking up here at me right now. It just It looks like you're really soaking it in really good. That's cool. Listen to this. God has a ministry for you in his church. Amen. He has some role for you in this church. I appreciate I won't name any names right now because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but one of the ladies of our church, like that one man stepped up and said, hey, my boy and I will cut the grass this week. One lady contacted me this week and said, hey, while Miss Gail is out, I'll be willing to help Miss Ollie with the kids. Isn't that great? Amen. Okay. 
Um, and I, I don't know what all your ministry might, God might have for you, but he'll show us. God has a ministry for you in his church. By the way, he also has a mission for you in the world. Amen. Always remember that. Y'all, as Christians, what is our mission in the world, y'all? Primary mission number one. Tell people about Jesus. Get the gospel out. The word gospel means good news. What's the good news, y'all? I'm going to give you a hint. There's three elements to it. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose. rose again the third day. Y'all, that's the gospel. That's the good news. No one can get saved unless they believe that. That's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That's our mission in the world. But we don't need to be sharing the gospel with each other in here, at least with those of us who have already been saved, because you don't need to get saved again. But we do. We don't have a mission for salvation with each other in the church, but we do have a ministry to each other, encouraging one another. And Lord willing, in the next uh, few weeks, we'll be talking to you about that. We'll be mentioning to you, if, you, if you'll do this, uh, um... Brother Scott doesn't know it yet, but during the Sunday school hour in August, I'm going to ask him, and, and he might turn around and say, no, Brother Steve, I don't want to do that. So it'll, that, I'll give him the liberty to do that. But I'm going to ask him to speak during one Sunday school hour this coming up to our whole group in the month of August, men and women. I'm going to ask Brother Ernie if I can twist his arm into coming in and maybe just speaking to our whole group during the Sunday school hour one Sunday in August. But i also like to share with you a couple of Sundays, just some opportunities for ministry, some ways you can help. So I hope you'll come to Sunday School every Sunday in the month of August. Every member is a minister. Listen to this, y'all. Be a participant, not just present. Amen. There's so much. You might not be able to serve in some major role. Your health might limit you. Or your schedule might limit you. But there's some way you can serve. I like this thought. Every member is a 10 in some area. There's some way, some place in this church, some role where the Holy Spirit will use you to do something that no, not another person in this church could do it any better than you. That's true of every one of you Christians sitting in. The key is for us to find out where you fit. Where's that niche? Some of you who have been to the membership class, remember that spiritual gifts test I gave you? That should be one indicator. Not perfect, but it should help. Some of you need to turn those spiritual gifts tests back into me, if you would, please. <laughs> if you misplace yours, that's all right, I'll get you another one. But that's one reason why we gave you that spiritual gifts test, to see... Maybe what your niche might be. Then let's close with this, y'all. It, it says here in 2 Kings 12 that finally they got the right plan and people were working together and a great work was being done. In verse 14 it says the workmen repaired the house of the Lord. It did get repaired. But I really like the same story. We'll close with this. The same story in 2 Kings 12 is kind of repeated in 2 Chronicles 24. So let's close with 2 Chronicles 24. After 2 Kings is 1 Chronicles, and after 1 Chronicles is 2 Chronicles, chapter number 24. If you'll look there with me, please. It's the same story, just a little bit more details given in this passage uh, that were uh, not recorded in 2 Kings 12. 2 Chronicles 24. All right? Say amen when you get there. All right? 2 Chronicles 24, let's pick up in verse 12. We'll look at verse 12, 13, and 14. <clears throat> it says, And the king, that's Jehoash, the king of Judah, that we read about in 2 Kings 12. Now we're 2 Chronicles 24, 12. It says, And the king in Jehoiada, you might remember Jehoiada was the high priest. The king in Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work, they gave them money, they gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord. That all sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same story, just a different book. And also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. They wanted to get it fixed up. Verse 13, so the workmen wrought, or that means the workmen worked. They did their job. 
Thank God for good workmen who do work right. Amen. Amen. The workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them. They did a really good job. And they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. They did a really, really good job. Verse 14, And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, whereof were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And you know, They had leftover money. So what did they do with the leftover money? They handled it the right way. They invested it back into the house of God. And then at the end of verse 14 it says, And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. A couple of concluding thoughts here. First of all, we see that they finished the job. Mm. Hey, when we start up, when the Lord leads us to start a work, and He stirs our hearts to start a work at Lulatin Baptist Church as a group, and when He stirs your heart to be involved in a ministry, in your own personal ministry, let's finish the job. Amen. Amen. Don't quit in the middle of it. Amen. Don't walk away from it. Let's finish the job, and let's finish it well. Amen. You see how those workmen, they, they made it look sharp? Then I love, you know, once the house of God was repaired, they could start worshiping again in the house of God. And there at the end of verse 14, it said they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually. Mm -hmm. All that could have a lot of meanings. Here's one prominent meaning when it says they offered burnt offerings. The Israelites, the people of Judah, they would have known what burnt offerings today, we don't offer, you know, animal burnt offerings today. But back 3,000 years ago, watch this, men, watch this, ladies. To them, a burnt offering sent this message. It symbolized this. Lord, we are totally devoted to you. Isn't that great? It was just another step in their spiritual life in their devotion to the Lord. I'm going to ask you, if you bow your heads with me, please. Close your eyes.